So Kirk took us back millions of years in the environment. Daly's talked about indigenous knowledge that's developed over thousands of years in the Arctic. Uh, and by the way, there will be a, a whole panel tomorrow, not going to be today as originally planned, on indigenous knowledge. Um, but now Heather Zeichel uh, will describe efforts in the past few decades to address the increasing rate of environmental change in the Arctic. Heather directs the Blue Prosperity Coalition. She previously served as a vice president for the Nature Conservancy and as President Obama's deputy assistant for energy and climate. Heather? Thanks. It goes forward. Oh, that's yeah. right. You don't have slides. No <laughs> slides. Thanks. I'm keeping it real simple. Um, so thank you, um, Dr. Kelly, for that introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to join you here today. Um, as, as, as Brendan laid out, um, I didn't have exactly um, a normal career trajectory to Washington, D.C. I grew up actually on a farm in Iowa and uh, never imagined that I would be advising the President of the United States on energy and climate policies, but found myself there. Um, and my path to Washington actually has an interesting path through Alaska. Um, the first trip that I ever took to Washington, D.C. was to lobby on behalf of protecting the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And it was through that opportunity, and I, was, I remember um, being at Rutgers University as a college student and having members from um, the Gwich'in community as well as the scientific community and sort of an NGO world come to our campus and talk about this issue. And that was really the first moment in time when I thought, wow, you know, this these, these issues are so incredibly important and to be able to understand them and have working knowledge of them and to be able to take a message to Washington about what I personally care about, not only for myself but on behalf of the rest of the country and for future generations was um, the, the whole reason I fell in love with environmental policy and, and decided that my life's goal then at that point in time was going to be to shift majors study environmental policy and, and ultimately I was lucky enough to get to come to Washington and I've served in a number of positions um, in government. I spent 10 years on the Hill um, working in both the House and the Senate um, including uh, working with um, se then Senator John Kerry uh, and then went into the White House to advise the President on energy and climate policy and, and now working in the NGO world trying to advance the issues that I care so deeply about. Um, but in that time, I've also had a great opportunity to work on a number of Alaska issues from the National Petroleum Reserve to roadless areas, Pebble Mine, Eisenbeck, um, and sort of everything in between. Um, and, and one of my favorite early stories of working in the White House is actually around Bristol Bay. Um, we, as, as many of of you in this room know, the Obama administration chose to permanently withdraw um, Bristol Bay from oil and gas leasing. And I remember sitting in the office and we had just gotten, we had just won and everybody was still trying to figure out where their office was and what our jobs actually were. And um, Secretary Salazar, the head of interior at the time, agreed to this policy. And so I remember we'd, we were just, I was sitting with one of the legal counsel uh, in, in the office, and I was like, all right, well, this is what we want to do. I don't really know how to figure it out. Um, and we basically ended up having this funny random conversation with some of the career, uh, career lawyers at, um, at the agency and, and writing you know, just a very few brief words. And with that, we ended up um, making this permanent protection for Bristol Bay. Uh, which is just to say, um, it was an amazing opportunity to get to work on those issues, but um, some things that seem daunting in the end are a lot easier than you think they might be at the outset. Um, so again, I, you know, I'm here because I want you to succeed, and, um, and to the extent that any of my knowledge from working in government or in the NGO space um, can provide some insight or, or, or suggestions for you in how to be successful, I, I'm happy, more than happy to do that. Um, you know, 
Dr. Kelly uh, asked me today for purposes of this panel to talk about what policymakers needed to know in 2050. And um, I'm not sure that I would have agreed to actually speak to this issue had we known about that at the beginning. I'd love to say I, can, I have a crystal ball and I could tell us, tell everybody in this room what we need to know and what policymakers are going to need to know in 2050. Um, but I think answering that question is really quite daunting. And in many cases, there's likely more questions than there are answers. But to figure out where we need to go, I think we need to take a step one step back and just sort of look at what got us here today. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, his, the history of, of these issues and when it comes to Arctic policy compared to Dali's conversation around indigenous knowledge or Kirk's reference to ice cover 18,000 years ago, Arctic policy in the United States really has a pretty baby history. Um, it wasn't really until 1971 under the Nixon administration that uh, a national security designation memo um, was our first foray into, uh, into this policy area. And the, 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 the focus of, of this work was to protect the environment, um, to think about cooperation, and to focus on the security threat. After that, you had a few blips of activity from Congress and the administration, but it wasn't really until 1991 that the United States stepped into um, uh, the, Arctic, uh, the Arctic agenda in a real and meaningful way. We joined eight other Arctic countries and signed the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, um, which was an agreement whose main purpose was to focus on coordination across uh, environmental and security issues in the eight Arctic countries. Um, fast forward to 1997, that strategy was absorbed into the Arctic Council. And today, it's the authoritative international body on Arctic issues, um, you know, as I said, to this day. Um, at the same time, the U.S. has uh, started to develop its own strategy towards addressing resource claims towards the region. And so I think as we, as, as you think about the policy framework for Arctic issues, there is this very interesting question about the role of the United States versus, you know, how much do we rely on um, treaties and, and, and joint action among other Arctic nations. Um, and certainly the way to think about those issues is against the backdrop of a rapidly changing Arctic. So you've got this policy context with a lot of questions, um, whether it's, you know, how to address population influx, commercial shipping, uh, marine transit, or military agreements. Um, you know, I think in this case, there's another instance of probably more questions than there are answers. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think the second observation I have is there is an embedded question about how governments are actually going to respond because the world is changing so quickly and the government, whether it's the U.S. government or individual governments or collectively, where is institutions, one of my observations having, after leaving the administration is, you know, because the world's changing so fast, I think it's really hard for governments to keep up. So as we're thinking about engaging around an Arctic strategy, keeping that in mind, like how does the government keep up? How do they try and get ahead of the curve? Um, I don't think anybody has answers to that question, um, but, but I think it's uh, an important consideration. Um, so, the, so after Arctic policy, I think the, the second, obviously, primary area to think through is the history of climate policy. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking, delving into the ugly history of how we got to where we are today. We are where we are. Um, but I think the big question that we all need to think about, and, and I know is obviously on your mind, is, um, you know, what, what um, give, given the, the, the agreement from Paris in 2015, um, it's safe to say the struggle is real when it comes to getting parties to complete their implementing measures and to getting Paris, uh, the, the Paris regime up and running. And so um, we recognize we need deep decarbonization. Um, we know that we have fewer, you know, few years to act. Um, we need a global response. And we also know that from a scientific perspective, 2018 was a pretty um, 
eye-opening year in that we had been on a bit of a plateau from global greenhouse gas emissions, but then saw a rise again in 2018. So how do all of the global policymakers take these data points into and how do we hold, um, hold leaders accountable for collective action? Um, so against the history of, of Arctic policy and climate policy, um, you know, I have a, I think the question is sort of what, what should we be thinking about on these issues over the next three days and how do we, um, how, where do we go from here? What are the obstacles? What should we be, we be keeping in mind? And I'd love to just, from my vantage point, share a few of, of my own observations um, in the hopes that they will help spark some ideas and conversation. Um, so the, my first observation when it comes to addressing Arctic policy is there's just way too many cooks in the kitchen in the US, at the US level. Um, in the executive office of the president alone, there are five different entities that have equities on Arctic policy. Then you go into a long list of acronyms, and I loved that one of the principles and one of the goals at the outset is to not use too much jargon. Um, but if I could put a slide up there, you would see a zillion different DOI, DOE, DHS, NSF, DOD, State Department. We have over a dozen agencies that also have authority to act and um, to play some role as we think about um, uh, as we think about the Arctic agenda. And um, on top of that, you have numerous Arctic research programs and other Arctic nations. So I say this not to depress us all, but to, to help us think about how we get very clear and specific about what the needs are, and to give you the background of, you know, when you're engaging with the U.S. government or the U.S. Senate around these issues, Congress, just being mindful that there are so many different agencies that have, um, as I said, equities in this in this conversation. Um, you know, you would never, if we were, if we were to spend the next day thinking about what's the best way to manage Arctic policy across the United States government, this isn't exactly the construct we would come up with, but it's the construct that we have. Um, and and while I can stand here today and say, but it's really hard to get people to work together. The truth is, it's really hard to get people to work together. And one, uh, I, I would say, of all of my six years um, in the administration, the biggest challenge um, was getting governments to work together across jurisdictions. And my primary takeaway is, if you do not have leadership from the top, either within an agency or in, or in our instance, from within the White House, um, it is really, really incredibly difficult to get things done. Um, so my second, my second observation um, is, is, again, n nothing that's going to be earth shattering for anyone in this room, but the Arctic is still really poorly understood. And um, continuing to highlight the need for sound scientific and socioeconomic data, Arctic research and monitoring and vulnerability assessments is really important. And the more that you know, the, this community can speak with one voice about those priorities and what's needed, the better chance um, you will have of success. Um, I think the, the next piece is, and, and this sort of builds off of Dolly's comments, um, there is an extreme need to bridge the gap between Western science and traditional knowledge. It must be treated as equal and it must be treated as part of the solution. I know many of the people in this room are working every day to make that happen, um, but you know, don't lose sight of that goal and, uh, and continue to, to, push, um, to push for better results from, um, and, and better recognition across the spectrum. Um, I think the, 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 the next observation that I wanted to share with you is, again, the perennial problem that you know. How do we address the lack of science funding, um, given that the costs of doing research in the Arctic are, are so much more, but at this point in time, more than ever, more crucial. Um, it's been, so I've now had all of four months working in the philanthropic community um, on oceans protection. and. To this day, no matter where I am in the world, I continue to be shocked at the lack of knowledge, the lack of access to funding, and the lack of cohesion across the donor community in terms of 
thinking through how they invest in this space and how they prioritize. So engaging there, I think, would be a, um, another key opportunity. Um, you know, the, the, the next part, um, uh, you know, of, of what, I, what, what, what I have observed is, you know, putting the precautionary principle to work is never easy. Um, not long ago, a decision was made to close the International Arctic to commercial fishing. So what about seabed mining, oil and gas development, and other industrial uses? I think there are interesting ways to sort of look at what's worked globally and how do we build out policy solutions based on things that we know have already been, have already been done. Again, one of, one of the lessons I learned uh, in the government is, is truly, you know, doing something for the first time is a lot harder than doing something that's already been done before. So being able to look at lessons learned across the globe and, and, and figuring out how we can plug in solutions that way, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're knocking down a lot of barriers earlier and, and, and increasing your chances of success. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I think the next, the next issue speaks to, yes, we spend a lot of time thinking about where we are today, but it's also very easy to um, forget about what we need to do to look around the corner. And when we think about 2050, we know two things. We know that if we are to achieve our climate objectives, the energy policy in this country is going to look a lot different than it does today. And the second thing we know is that the Arctic region is not going to look the same as it does today. So if, you know, if, you know, if we know these things, um, we, we need to sort of look at that trajectory and think through what, what role and, and um, what do we need to be thinking about as, as we engage or, or, or um, uh, plan for the future of the oil and gas sector. And as much as there's a lot of focus right now about you know, where to drill, what not to drill, and how to regulate, one of the things that I have on my mind, and, and this sort of gets to how do we look around the corner, how do, we, how do we actually have the conversation about phasing out oil and gas in a responsible manner? Because if we, if we don't do the work today or start thinking about the agenda for what it looks like for communities um, when the oil and gas sector is transitioning out, you know, it, you, we, we can't afford to have a trail of destruction left behind. So there's the aging infrastructure questions, you know, leaking methane, uh, water contamination, et cetera, and nobody is really thinking about what responsible and proper phase out looks like. Uh, for our communities, so I would, I you know, I, I think that's one area where we need to um, get, you know, to get on the mission before it's decided for us. Um, and then, again, the so the, the my last observation is probably also not earth shattering to those in this room, but it is worth stating that science and policy are just a hard mix; they always have been. And in the Arctic, it's another set of challenges because it's not a place where the general population can easily associate with it. If, I mean, I, it, it is, it's one thing to read about what's happening to communities like Shishmaref on the North Slope and what communities are facing in terms of coastal erosion. It's a complete other thing to go and see that and understand how all these challenges fit together. Um, but the more we are able to put a face um, on these challenges, the better. And I, and I think in this instance, this is why, in particular, traditional knowledge is, is so key. Um, I would also say, I think the more we can think about telling a holistic story and sort of connecting the dots around the Arctic, because People, the general public is definitely waking up and, and are more aware of, of climate change and its impacts, but there's not always the obvious connection between the Arctic and mid-lateral locations that are going to be directly impacted by Arctic change. Um, and in fact, you know, we have a very strong case to make that the entire world uh, will be impacted given the amplifying effect of Arctic change has with climate. 
So I think that, you know, that's another important component to, to, to keep in mind. Um, and then, so, so as I was thinking about my remarks today, um, one of the, so, so basically it's like, okay, so this is great and really enlightening, but what do we do? Um, and, you know, I, I want to end not on a down note because I do think that we have a lot to build from on this agenda. It's one of the few issues that Democrats and Republicans have been aligned on. You've got great leaders in senators like Lisa Murkowski, Senator Cantwell, um, and, and others across, uh, across the political spectrum. And um, I think we have, we have a lot to build from. And, you know, when, it, when, when you boil it all down, um, we, it sounds pretty simple, but we have a crisis. We need leadership. We need people that can, um, you know, we need leaders that can call others to the table and force a process around these decisions. And, I, you know, I, I personally think that it, nobody, um, <laughs> nobody's going to do this on their own. So this is an area where American leadership counts and we need to hold our elected officials accountable. So with that, I will wrap up.